when disaster strikes. Will you be ready? Good evening, and we begin tonight with the monster hurricane and its deadly impact already. When all hope is gone, will the government be there for you? If you're looking for ways to take your prepping to the next level, then you've come to the right place. Broadcasting from a secure and well-prepared location, it's time for Prepping 2.0. And now, please welcome authors Glenn Tate and Shelby Gallagher. Welcome, everyone. This is Shelby Gallagher at Prepping 2.0. And I am excited for our topic this week, our guest this week, who will come to us with a multitude of amazing topics. So before we get into that, let me um, say hello and welcome my co-host of this show and co-host in real life, Glenn Tate. Hi, Shelby. This is going to be this is going to be great. This is one of these things where the guest and the topics are kind of the same because the topic is whatever our guest wants to talk about because he has so many great things to talk about and there's so much happening. Uh, Matt Bracken, who many of you know from well, from a variety of things, uh, enemies, foreign, domestic, um, a bunch of other things. Um, and he was on the show uh, a couple months, months ago, ago yeah. and it was a huge hit. Everybody wanted more. One of the things we'll be doing in the show, besides acting, acting, asking Matt what's going on with current events and the things, coronavirus things and other things, and with an eye on instability in the United States and what is coming in the the next few months. I mean, you know, elections and murder hornets and things like that. And then as I was going to say as usual, but it's now becoming a trend, a recent trend. We're going to have Patreon questions. The uh, Patreons are folks that support us uh, with $2 a month, up to $20 a month, and they get to ask questions of our cool guests. And so they have asked quite a few really interesting questions for Matt, and then we will be playing those in the after show, which is after the regular show that some of you are hearing on the Internet, on YouTube, on Spotify. Uh, Spotify, Podbean, iTunes, and um, the and, radio. And our website at prepping 2 0 That's right. And quite a few, yeah, folks listening on terrestrial radio. We love you guys. Um, ap- after that show's over, the after show is where all the really good stuff happens because the 52 minute regular show is just a warm up. So then at the after show, we, we will have Matt answering um, Patreon's questions. It'll be good. Um, we wanted to mention real quickly goodie bags. One of the other things about being a Patreon is that once a year in July, we have goodie bags that we send out to um, our Patreons based on the level of their support. So the more you pay us, the more cool stuff you get and the more, more cool merch. Yes, it is a class system and no, we don't care. And uh, and so those are coming out in July. And if you're thinking about either being a Patreon or upgrading your level to get more cool stuff, and we have some awesome, we haven't even shown it yet. We we got it back in December um, before all this, the Chinese factory shut down. And so um, really neat stuff. And then, and Shelby, why don't you go ahead and read an email that we got from one of our Patreons about the goodie bags and about upgrading levels. Uh, He just simply said, and I think he says it really well in one sentence, I will not upgrade, I will upgrade not for the goodies, but for the solid info, the both of you, from the both of you and your guests. Accent on the guests, by the way, that's what's really making it. As I often say, the guests and the Patreon questions make the show, and Shelby and I are just kind of the glue that that holds it all together, and we we do that. So, wanted to briefly mention some of our great sponsors. We have EMP Shield, who makes a device that uh, connects to something, and it protects that something, whether it's a generator or a house or truck or something like that, from an EMP. Um, New Mana, freeze dried food, long term, twenty five year plus freeze-dried food in large quantities, like family kind of style portions, not, you know, mountain house, individual. Single serving. Yeah, mm-hmm. camping things. KD Armor, C-A-T-I, which stands for Come and Take It Armor. And then a bot's body armor, obviously. And then Backwoods Home, which is a magazine that's been around for decades and comes quarterly. And we love the magazine and we love talking about them, but we're not going to talk about them anymore. We're going to say hello to Matt, ask him to introduce himself, tell us about himself. And then we're just going to have him talk for about the next 48 minutes and we're going to love it. Hi, Matt. <laughs> hey, yeah, this is uh, Matt Bracken and um, calling from Florida where I'm under a very loose quarantine. Yeah. Walking, <laughs> very good in. for you. Um, you know, th- this is, uh, what, day 60 or something of our national shutdown that was sold as, you know, which I was fully in support of, of being careful at the beginning when 
the first predictions were millions could die, and it was the whole shutdown was sold as we have to flatten the curve in order to not flatten our hospitals. Right. You know, that if our if if the pandemic got so out of control that you know gurneys were stacked up to the parking lots of all the hospitals, then you know the death would just soar astronomically. But that didn't happen. You know, we had, we never did, maybe a little bit in New York, we never did get to the point where we ran out of ventilators, which don't seem to be the holy grail anymore at this point. You know, the 40,000 ventilators was a, turns out to be a, you know, big joke because I think that most people that ever get put on a ventilator are going to die. Mm. You know, so we're learning a lot more about the disease and it's a serious disease. In some ways, it's, um, you know, it's worse than we knew at the beginning because it does, it seems to not just be something that affects your lungs. And if you get better, you fully recover. It seems like a lot of people have, uh, are going to have lifetime consequences, um, you know, that recover from this thing. It's definitely not the flu. Yeah, it's definitely not the flu. A lot of people make very fallacious comparisons to, um, like to say the 1968 Hong Kong flu. I looked into it. The 1968 Hong Kong flu lasted for two years and killed 100,000 Americans. And this thing, I mean, you know, every, every all these figures are debatable, right? But, I mean, just taking the figures, official figures for what they are, it's killed 80,000 in two months. Yeah. So it's definitely on a pace that's beyond Hong Kong flu. And as far as that, the curve that we were showing, that we were being shown a couple months ago, you know, where it would get up and then come back down, we're kind of just plateaued at about 2,000 deaths a day. You know, and since we're now reopening the economy, it's probably going to stay there, you know, at that 2,000 deaths mm -hmm. a day thing, which is not good. And, the, the you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's just old, mostly old people or people with comorbidities. But if you add up everybody who's got a problem with their weight, their heart, their kidneys, hmm. uh, diabetes, or is over the age of 65, you're talking about a third of Americans. Yep. And when people talk about, let's just go for herd immunity, I think that's a, that's a really big mistake too, because herd immunity requires two thirds of a population to have a disease and then recover from it so that new, new outbreaks, when they are hopping around, they just keep landing on people that have already, um, you know, have the antibodies and are immune we're still way below 10%, maybe at most 5%. To get to two-thirds of Americans, if you just, you know, extrapolate out, you know, millions of people would have to die to get to mm -hmm. two-thirds of Americans have it. And I, I looked into the um, the Spanish flu, which killed way more people around the world. Um, estimates are between like 50 and 100 million people around the world. And only 20% of people got it. So it went away without herd immunity. You know, if you, if you do enough of the social distancing for long enough, everybody doesn't have to get infected for the disease to go away. It's, people seem to think it's either a vaccine or herd immunity. That's the only ways that a, a disease can go away. Um, but when you, when you think about it, things like smallpox were terrible in the colonial era. And it didn't just wipe out America. You know, they had no herd immunity, no, no idea of a vaccine. But people started figuring out how to mitigate against smallpox. You know, if people have it, don't don't let them come into your house. You know, quarantine them. So I mean, even even without herd immunity, which is two thirds, or a vaccine, diseases can be beat. Mm -hmm. You know, they, but it's difficult. It's difficult. And unfortunately, in our political era, everything becomes a political fight. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that in this, in 2020, since the Democrats are making political hay out of the pandemic and attacking conservatives and Trump over it, I think a lot of conservatives who aren't exactly deep thinkers <laughs> say if the Democrats say it's really bad, then it's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see people saying, I refuse to wear a mask. Like a mask is a slave symbol. Mm -hmm. But they're beating it in Korea and in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. 
and a lot of European countries because, like, you know, to get on a bus, to get on an airplane, you have to wear a mask. But without a mask, your breath is going out six feet, and, and your coughs are going out like 20 feet. But with a mask, you're just making, you're just basically staying in your own little cloud. Because the problem with this disease is it's spread by asymptomatic carriers. So you can, you can be 40 and just not even know you have it and go home and infect your, your mom. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's not a simple thing where it's just like, it's a hoax, the tyrants, the globalists, it's a real thing. And I, I, I compare this to, I compare this to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And when that happened, it was, you know, an overt attack. Yeah, it was a sneak attack, but once it happened, you know, the planes that were hitting Pearl Harbor were marked planes. You know, we know who did it. We declared war, and four years later, we nuked them, and they surrendered. So an overt attack, an overt military attack, resulted in American unity and determination and resolve to go for victory. Unconditional surrender of the Japanese and the Germans. But we get attacked with a a biological weapon, and what do we do? We attack each other. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful. From the Chinese point of view, this is beautiful. So you've got to make an attack on your enemy. You want to do a Pearl Harbor, but you don't want to get Hiroshima out of it. <laughs> exactly. You want, to, you, want to do, you want to attack your enemy, and then what's the best result of an attack on your enemy? Your enemy attacks themselves. Right. They don't even attack you. They attack themselves. You know, if you wear a mask, you're a coward, you're a slave. But that's ridiculous. In 1918 to 1920, the Spanish flu, everybody wore masks. They had no vaccines. They had no herd immunity. They didn't play, you know, they didn't play sports. They didn't go to movie theaters well, you know, or any theaters. There weren't a lot of movie theaters, but they didn't do public events like that. Eventually, it panned out. No vaccine, no herd immunity. But everybody was unified in the goal now, what the Chinese have done has got us attacking each other. Yeah. They attack us with a biological weapon, and we attack each other. So it's perfect from their point of view. So, and, and, I mean, it's, it's working from their point of view. It's working. So let me ask you this, Matt, and I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. What, is, what are you finding out, or what are you seeing from where you're sitting? How much of this was coordinated, planned? By China, because uh, I'm hearing all well, over the media, it's all over the place. Not people- only China, not only China. Even people like Fauci and the Bat Lady are in- definitely involved. Mm, you wow. know, there are there are there are people. There are virologists who I think they have. Maybe it's narcissism. It's like a, a form of narcissism to believe that their pet hobby is like the most noble search for the Holy Grail that's worth any risk. Mm-hmm. Because this this gain of function research, which are making generic viruses, you know this this gain of function research was basically shut down in the last few years in America and Canada. And this bat lady, she shows up in you know North Carolina and Canada, back in Wuhan, and Fauci, he's got this holy grail idea. I think that, you know, because I always look at people's motivations, and a lot of that is age. If you're 79, I don't think you're in it for the money. Right. <laughs> you know, um, Fauci has been riding on the fame of, the, of AIDS research since the 80s. Yes. And he's been like a guru of virology after being part of a team effort that came up with... with um, with, with uh, not vaccines, but um, medical, um, which I'm losing the yeah. term right now, but... Well, like the, treatments, um, just the treatment of AIDS. The, the, yeah, the treatments, yeah, med- antivirals for AIDS. But he's been riding that, and he wasn't like the guy, he didn't get like the crown for that. He was just part of that team. But for 40 years, he's been like, the, you know, Mr. Virology because of AIDS research. So when they're shutting down this gain of function research because it's so dangerous. You know, the, the, the supposed rationale 
for doing this this gain of function where you're where you're making Frankenstein viruses. You're saying, well, what if something did change from a bat virus that was transmissible to humans? We have to understand all about how this works. So we'll go ahead and make a Frankenstein bat virus transmissible to humans just in case it happens naturally, we'll already be ready. Hmm. But what if it gets out of the lab? You got no virus. Got no vaccine. So to me, it's, it's, yeah. it's a really bad excuse for doing this kind of super dangerous research that it's so that we could make a virus in case it happened in nature, we'll already be ready. Yeah, well, you made the, the Frankenstein virus in the Wuhan lab, you know, piggybacking on work done at Fort Detrick and in in Winnipeg and in North Carolina, and then it gets out of the Wuhan lab. Now we got no vaccine and no nothing. And something I've been I've been watching this guy. If you're, I'm sure you've heard of him, Paul Cottrell. No, yeah. no, I haven't. Um, Go ahead. Yes, yeah, yeah. C O T T R E L L. He's he's a, totally a genius. And three months ago, he was he, he was he nailed this three months ago, and he's dead on it ever since. And also Tim Martinson who does um, peak prosperity video, but he's a PhD pathologist. Mm -hmm. This is no way a natural uh, zoonotic virus. You know, if, if you have a, a white dog and a white dog and you have a puppy with a white body and a black head, that could be a mutation. But if you have a dog with the head of a cat, mm. it's not a mutation. It's something done in a lab. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. A, a, you know, a, a white cat with black paws is a mutation. A white cat with a dog's head is Frankenstein. Yeah. You know, when you look at Frankenstein's monster and you see the sutures on the neck, that's where they put Joan's head on Smith's body. Mm -hmm. And the and virologists can look at at the at the RNA code of the of the SARS CoV two. And they can see the Frankenstein sutures. Hmm. And it's way worse than a natural virus because it attacks multiple receptors in the body. That's why they're saying now, crap, it isn't just the lungs. It can attack the heart, the brain, the kidney, the kidneys. Hmm. I mean, people that survive it have to go, some of them have to go on dialysis. Many people have this, this um, broken glass syndrome in their lungs. So even after you've recovered, you're basically kind of like a World War I mustard gas survivor. You know, you're, you, you're going to have a limited lung capacity for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's why the military is saying we can't take, accept any recruits that have recovered from this. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're looking down the road, it's going to be like a 9-11 syndrome. You know, the people that went into the ground zero. Yeah. And then 10 years later, they're all coughing and hacking and dying. You know, this isn't like the flu where you just get over it and then you're back to 100%. And there are a lot of, you know, because of this, this chimeric nature, that chimera is, uh, you know, like the, uh, from mythology, it's like, the, yes. I forget what the animals were, but it's like three animals, like a well, edible like lion. Well, and a, I always understood a chimera a, human is a human that has two forms of DNA in one person. Is that what is that what you're referring to? Well, a, a, a chimera from like Greek mythology mm -hmm. is like the body of a lion and the head of it's like three different animals. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, but it, but this 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 virus has AIDS characteristics. It attacks a lot of different parts of the body. I was watching a really excellent video today, which is um, Alan Keyes, you know political guy, but very mm -hmm. smart conservative, mm -hmm. his own man for sure, interviewing Paul Cottrell um, under an hour. This is definitely, Paul Cottrell says this is like a pinball virus. It goes around your body till it finds the receptor. It might attack your lungs, it might not. It might attack your kidneys, it might mm -hmm. attack your heart. This is, a, this is a weaponized virus. This is a biological weapon that got out of a lab. And Fauci had the NIH fund 3.7 million for this research. So talk about which is probably 
So talk about that. Mm-hmm. Can you connect the dots for our listeners? Because I agree with what you're, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And if anyone can connect those dots, I think you can. So uh, he funded that research through, and there's a connection to the Ga- Gates Foundation. We only have about four minutes. So you got to do this fast, yeah, Matt. Exactly. The Gates Foundation. And, and in the Paul Cottrell video today where he's interviewed by Alan Keyes, he talks, they talk about that, the Gates Foundation and, and their vaccines, which are a type of, this is maybe the holy grail that Fauci's holding out for. Fauci, I don't think he's out for the money. He's out for the statue. Mm-hmm. You know, he's out for the university named after him or a Nobel Prize for medicine. That's his holy grail. Mm-hmm. And what he's looking for is a type of vaccine that will be like a universal vaccine. Mm-hmm. He wants to be on the pantheon of legends with like Louis Pasteur and Jonas Salk, you know, Jonas Salk mm-hmm. and and um, Fleming, you know the penicillin guy. Yeah, <clears throat> and and so he's looking for like a universal vaccine for viruses, sort of the way we were a hundred years ago, just learning how to beat bacteria with penicillin. Mm-hmm. He's looking for something that will beat all viruses. Yeah. And and he's playing right in along with Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and the their foundation doing this virus research. But the the type of vaccines that Fauci and Gates are after could be very dangerous because they're they're really they're really uh, sophisticated vaccines that can have a lot of more input than just curing this virus. Hmm. I mean, you know, the, when you add in that. The Gateses have been trying to curb population growth forever. It's like mm-hmm. one of their stated missions. Too yeah. many people on the planet. I mean, who's, who wants to take a vaccine from people that are trying to <laughs> cut the population of the world? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then there's, so there's the connection where there's a very tight connection between Fauci and the Gates Foundation and Fauci and NIH and the World Health Organization. Let me look at the clock here really quick. How much time do we have left, Glenn? Two, three minutes in this minutes. segment, and then there's yeah, another and then segment. Yeah, and then we'll find something more happy to talk about <laughs> on the other side of the break. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah and it, but then this is all this is all coming through in a way that the Democrats will exploit it, and we're going to talk about in the next segment. We'll talk about you know the deep state coup, but the Democrats might lose the deep state coup, but we still win the war because. They're turning our country into a socialist country where we just print money and give everybody a monthly check. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're very happy to have everybody stay home. We'll be a wrecked economy. We'll be like, you know, Venezuela or Argentina in the 1930s under Perón, you know, where you just take a functioning economy and absolutely destroy it, hand out money and then wreck the economy. But you'll always get votes by yeah. telling people, hey. If you vote for the conservatives, they're going to cut off your free money. If you vote for us, we'll double your free money. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, it will just run the printing presses and you'll be broke, but you'll have a check. Yeah. And people will fall for that. Yeah, and that's, and that's, that's working. It is working. And, and we're going to um, go out of this segment. And when we come back, uh, Matt is going to hopefully talk about some of the effects of the regulations and the restrictions. And then a bit this bigger one, which is socialism mm-hmm. which if i were china that's a twofer i've i've crippled the united states and i've made them a socialist country and socialism and crippling a company uh, country are the same doggone thing so stick with us for segment two everybody we'll be back with matt bracken we'll be right back with more of prepping 2.0 with authors shelby gallagher and glenn tate right after this prepping 2.0 is about that next level of prepping One of the key 2.0 items to have is bulletproof body armor plates. I used to think body armor was too tactical for a regular guy like me, but it isn't. Give yourself, your family, and your team an unfair advantage when bullets are flying. Body armor used to be expensive and hard to get. Not anymore. KD Armor, and that stands for come and take it, makes solid and affordable body armor for normal people. Get body armor while you can. The clowns in Congress are trying to prohibit future sales. KD Armor is the place to get it. C-A-T-I armor.com. Prepping 2.0 listeners get a 10% discount when you use the coupon code GRANT. 
PrepperNet, where preppers unite. Looking to meet other like-minded people in your area? Looking to start your own prepper group? Already have a group? Join PrepperNet.com. PrepperNet has gathered the biggest names in the industry to help unite preppers everywhere. Join John Jacob Schmidt, Scott Hunt, Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy, Glenn Tate, Shelby Gallagher, Charlie Hogwood, Samuel Culper, Survivor Jane, Rick Austin, Franklin Horton, Ryan Mitchell, and Brian Duff. Our team is united. Check us out at PrepperNet.com. PrepperNet, where preppers unite. PrepperNet.com. When the grid goes down, darkness will descend fast. Used to be there was nothing you could do about an EMP, electromagnetic pulse, or CME, coronal mass ejection. Now you can protect your electronics, protect your family, thanks to EMP Shield. EMP Shield invented a simple to install device that prevents whatever's connected to it from frying in an EMP or a CME, and it costs just a few hundred dollars. EMP Shield has been tested by independent laboratories and passed muster with the government, which has ordered lots of them. Google EMP Shield and see for yourself. And save some money. Get a $50 discount per device. Go to prepping2-o.com. Click on the Friends and Affiliates page, then click on the EMP Shield logo. At checkout, use coupon code PREPPING2.0. It's all one word. Shelby Gallagher here. We found that you need to layer your food preps. Yeah, this is Glenn Tate here. A lot of times the hardest part of layering is the long-term foods. We love new mana foods, which have a 25-year shelf life and are non-GMO. Also, organic meals are available. New mana comes in family-style portions and in bulk. This is not backpacking food. It's family meals that last for at least 25 years. The perfect freeze-dried part of your food layering. You can get a sample of Numana meals for $19.95 and see for yourself. You will be amazed. Prepping 2.0 listeners get a 10% discount by entering the code PREP. Go to Numana.com or click the link on the Prepping 2.0 website. Give it a try. Numana.com. That is N-U-M-A-N-N-A.com. And we're back with more of Prepping 2.0 with authors Glenn Tate and Shelby Gallagher. Welcome back, everyone. Shelby Gallagher here with our awesome guest, Matt Bracken, talking about some of the just crazy things um, and and knowledge that he has regarding uh, the COVID-19 virus and, and how... And the it, reactions there, too. And the reactions there, too. And, and I, just, I just want to throw this in here because it's so important that we as preppers, we who are part of that prepared mind um, community know these things we need to know these things so that we're that much more prepared so we were gonna what were we gonna talk about glenn Go ahead. well i mean uh, matt can finish up anything he has about sort of gates and fauci and then um i wanted to see if he could focus on the reactions to that meaning how the government is cracking down both the details things like contact tracing and then also the bigger picture about what you were alluding to matt which is socialism so yeah what do you think about all that well i'm gonna I want to go to China Mm. and look at this from the Chinese perspective. And one way that one comparison that I make is to the um, a scene in the classic movie everybody should have watched several times by now, Doctor Strangelove. Love it. Where where um, the general the the general in charge of a B fifty two wing sends his wing out to attack Russia and does it in a way that they can't be recalled, Mm. so that. So that he th- he thinks that SAC command and the and the president will be forced to piggyback on his rogue attack with a full attack, because the alternative is when the Russians pick up these you know twenty five or so B fifty twos coming in to nuke their country, they're going to launch everything on America. And George C. Scott in the war room says, "Look, we're sorry it happened. It's regrettable. It's a mistake." But we can't just sit here and let the Russians do a massive retaliation. You know, what we should, you know, it, we can't pull back what happened already. Right. But we, we might, if it's going to happen, we might as well win it. And I think that's what China did, if you take the point of view that the release may have been an accident. It's a bioweapon. It's a, like a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Maybe worse in a way. It's, you can't stop it. But once it's released... I think that the Chinese generals said, it's regrettable, we wish it didn't happen, but it's happened. That's why they kept the flights going out of Wuhan to the rest of the world, exactly. even when they weren't letting them fly to the rest of China. Exactly. You know, if we're going to, ha- we're not going to be the only ones to have suffer this. If they had 
warned the world in December, they could have built up a lot of goodwill, and maybe the world would have come to their rescue. But now the world is going to hate China. But I, I look at this from the Chinese perspective, and number one, they're very smart. They got one and a, one and a half billion people, 1.4 billion people, and that means they've got way more geniuses than we do. <laughs> their average IQ may or may not be higher than ours, but out of 1.4 billion, if you need like 100,000 genius IQ people, they've got them in every field. Mm -hmm. And they have studied in their country and they understand us. So they have people in their war room saying, now that this virus is going around the world, we can control our population. We can force them to take vaccines. Even if it's like a mass experiment and we lose, we'll just next month, we'll take another city, mass vaccinate them. We can force them to carry a smartphone you know, with a, Q, with a, with a um, square code, a QR type code that they have to hold up anytime, any place that'll ping if they're like close to another bad comrade or ping if they're close to an infected person or a recovered person. So they can do all this. And they know that our chaotic free society, we'll, ha we'll even argue about wearing masks. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see, we'll have like protests where everybody intentionally bunches up two feet apart with no masks on. So they know that they can, their perspective is they can win a biological war because using totalitarian controls, they can be harsh enough to stamp it out, whereas it's going to burn and burn and burn in a free country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, one of the ways of looking at Sweden versus Italy, for example, okay, Sweden's doing the, going for the herd immunity, but Swedes stand seven feet apart anyway. Yeah. You know, Scandinavians aren't like Italians. Italians are hugging and kissing each other, Spanish. Mm -hmm. Hugging and kissing. You meet, you're hugging and kissing everybody on both cheeks. Swedes, Scandinavians, they're standing 10 feet apart all the time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's a, it's, I'm being a little, little levity there, but <laughs> the, the Chinese know that the same controls that they can institute on China can never be instituted in their country, which gives them a huge edge. If you can force everybody to wear a mask and take a vaccine or or lock them into their and uh, weld them into their apartment until mm -hmm. they starve. Yeah. That gives them a way to stop the pandemic that we can't do. Well and, and So it's gonna burn and burn and burn. And a lot of and what we're just coming to grasp with, you know, when nine eleven happened, okay, three thousand died, boom. That's like the eighty thousand dead, boom, they're dead. What we're going to be coming to grasp with for the next five years is all of these people that recovered have, that have ruined lungs and they're on dialysis. That's right. why the military is saying we won't take a recruit if they've re quote unquote recovered. So, yeah, this is going to be a syndrome. It's going to be, you know, mm -hmm. COVID-19 syndrome. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's just... And it's going to be something that weakens us progressively. So I, I, I don't like to see stupid things like the lockdown, obviously what they did in the Democrat states with, I think I read, I just heard today, not only New York, but New York, New Jersey, Illinois, California, all sent COVID patients to the old folks homes. Yes. Yeah. Nursing care facilities. Whereas in Florida, we didn't. You know, DeSantis has been terrific. And it's absolutely stupid to say, let's close the beach. <laughs> you know, outside in fresh air is the safest place. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to wear a mask when I'm riding a bike around. Yeah. But I but I will wear one when I'm in the 7-Eleven. Well, well, I'm not there, but I don't go there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when I go to my supermarket, I wear an N95 mask because half the knuckleheads are wearing no mask. Right. If everybody was wearing just like a, you know, 70% uh, effective mask, the thing would be dying out fast, like it did in 1917, or 1918, 1919. But when you have half the people, because you, disinformation works, propaganda works. It does. So this whole thing about, if you wear a mask, you're for tyranny. The Chinese are laughing their asses off at that. Absolutely. They know, the, every, everybody knows that this is an airborne thing, and if you and I are standing four feet apart talking to each other, 
we're breathing these virus boogers at each other. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a, a term called, there's a, there is a term called the inoculum. A humans tend to think that everything invisible is just too tiny to think about. But if you look at like a bacteria, that's like an invisible blue whale. And if you look at a, a virus, that's an invisible guppy. So there's a humongous difference between a blue whale and a guppy or a bacteria and a virus. So we just think, well, it's too small, so who cares? I can't see it. But if you're talking to me and, and I breathe in a big booger, you know, a, a aerosolized booger with a million virus on it, and that it lands in my lower lung, that's like getting shot with a deer slug in the heart. Mm. If yeah. I touch a counter and then I touch my face and it a little bit to, gets to my lips and into my throat and a little bit to my lungs, that might be like getting shot with a BB. So in both cases, we'll have antibodies to COVID-19. But one is getting shot with a BB and one is getting shot with a deer slug. Yeah. So what the mask does is keep you from breathing in the deer slug. You're not going to yeah. get that you know, million virus booger that's all invisible. Remember, it's all invisible. And humans can't do scale like that. If it's invisible, it's too tiny to think about. Mm -hmm. But you've got invisible bacteria that are like a blue whale and invisible virus. It's like a guppy. So when people say, well, why wear a mask? Because the virus is too small. It can go through. The virus isn't floating by itself. The virus is part of a a particle of vapor and, and phlegm and you know, your lung, lung vapor. So at a microscopic scale, it's way too big to get through an N95 mask. And, and it will, the big stuff will be caught even by a cotton mask, yeah. coming or going. So when you wear a mask, you may be an asymptomatic carrier. You don't intend to go to the supermarket and infect anybody, but you don't know if you are. So if everybody is wearing a mask, you can then open the economy up like they're doing in most Asian countries. Because once everybody's wearing a somewhat effective mask, like I said, even an N95, if you and I are both wearing an N95, that's like 99.9% can't, I can't give it to you, you can't give it to me. Mm -hmm. But even if we're both wearing 50% effective masks, it's a 75% reduction. 50% times 50%, 25% is what's left. So it's a 75% reduction in the transmission between two people. That's huge yeah. compared to just, say, being in a theater and everybody's going at 100%. I mean, they, there was a, a choir. This is early on, like in March. It was like before Easter. There was a choir practice, and out of like, you know, 75 people, 50 people got it. They were all singing for an hour hmm. in one room. That's like a worst case how to spread it. So if I go to the beach, I'm not worried at all. I'm not wearing a mask. Well, and that's a good, one that's a good thing about the beach. Let's let's talk about the restrictions that are out there yeah. and and not necessarily what the details are, because everybody watches the news and knows the details. What do you think about the reaction to the restrictions? Do you think Americans are going to put up with this i mean maybe they are maybe they are in some parts and everything because i'm fascinated by the um the loss of liberties well, I, and I all wish that we could, i wish i wish conservatives could do a better job of differentiating the risks and the dangers mm -hmm. from the from the you know the, there's the political tyranny angle you know if you're in michigan or if you're in right. maryland or you know california I get it. I'm for the guy that's out surf paddle boarding, you know? Um, but the response shouldn't be if the Democrats think it's a really bad thing and we should be locked down, then I refuse to wear a mask and I want to blow, you know, breathe in your face to prove it's a hoax. Well, that's just See, that's, that's wrong. That's not the right result. That's not well, the right answer. That's the, that's the right answer. Sure, ring. they're trying right. to promote it to, to turn our country socialist. And I will protest it, but I'm not going to, like, get up in somebody's face and say it's all a hoax. Right. That just right. makes us look stupid and reckless. Well, and that's what I'm it's getting at. It's a real at. thing. Is it, the, this is a real yeah. virus. 
Yeah, the reaction, though, not turning America into a socialist country. Let's assume, because I think there's evidence of this, China let this go and they would love for us to be socialists and tearing each other apart. What, what do you make of the uh, resistance to socialism or maybe the general population's embrace of socialism? What do you think about that? No, uh, well, sure. You know, if, if you want to ruin a people, give them welfare, put them on a reservation. Yeah. You know, you don't own your house on the reservation. That's why they look like crap, because it's not your house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're just assigned a trailer. Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to destroy a people, put them on a reservation and give them welfare. And that's what the Democrats are doing through this. And, and, and you know, the Democrats would prefer to rule the ruins. They would mm-hmm. love to be, you know, Chavez or Maduro in charge of a wrecked America, Venezuela, because mm-hmm. that's permanent power. Mm-hmm. You know, that's permanent power. They don't care if the country is ruined as long as they're in charge of it. Because they'll be rich at the top. They'll be powerful and rich at the top. So they're taking this as their opportunity to totally wreck the country. Yes. Yeah. But I think that it's, but, but this may just be the straw that's breaking the camel's back anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, even before COVID-19, we've been talking about fractional reserve banking and, mm-hmm. the, and our, you know, trillions of dollars in debt. So just adding five more trillion, which is like a thousand billion, a million million. I mean, it's it's astronomical. They're just printing it from thin air. It's eventually going to be Weimar Germany. And you know who's, and you know what China's doing? China is mining and buying gold. Yeah. Physical gold. Actually. I think that as our economy is wrecked, they're going to declare a gold backed currency. You know, this um, America's America was the, the reserve currency of the world from World War II until, depending on how you peg it, you know, through the 70s, even into this century, because even after we closed the gold window under Nixon, because the French and, and the other Europeans said, you know what, we'll just, you said it's $35 an ounce, we'll take the gold. Yeah. So Nixon closed the gold window, quote unquote. And after that, we've basically been like the American ruble. But Kissinger linked it to the to petroleum, which gave us like another generation of being the world's reserve currency. Because if you wanted to buy shiploads of oil, you had to buy them in dollars. We made that deal with Saudis yeah. and OPEC. But if you wanted to buy a shipload of oil, you couldn't buy it with marks or pesos. You had to convert your your funny money into American dollars. So that gave us another generation. But now that's coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And we're going to wreck our currency. Oil means nothing. You can get oil. You know, they'll, they'll pay you to take a shipload of oil. Cause there's nowhere to put it. So, so oil, the whole pet- petrodollar thing is as dead as a dodo. <laughs> and in a year or two, China is going to say, we have a new currency backed in gold. Yeah. And good money bad drives out bad. And, we're just going to be like Argentina, that was like one of the richest countries in the world in the early 20th century, went down this socialism path because it was a way to get votes, mm-hmm. and just totally wrecked their prosperity, wrecked their you know their economic engine, wrecked it, blew it up. Once you blow it up, you know if you you have a perfectly running Swiss watch, you smash it with a hammer. You're not just not going to put that sucker back together. Yeah. Yeah. You know and. So, so this may just be the, the time of our reckoning. Right. Like, you know, the, at the end of World War II, Britain went into World War II as like the great, you know, on par with America's Navy. You know, the sun never sets on the British Empire. That's how they went into World War II. They sold all their gold and, you know, wrecked their military. I mean, spent their military, so to speak. And after World War II, they were done. Yeah. They were a hollow shell. Now they can't even, you know, they can barely put a ship into the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that China is just playing their time, and China is looking at us as, as a, like Britain, you know, from the 40s to the 50s. We're on our way down. Yeah. That's how China sees us. But they're smarter than the Japanese. They wouldn't give us a Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor would unite us. Oh, and they know that, too. Yeah, they know that. 
Very so, smart. So what are your thoughts are with all of this happening, Matt? What are your thoughts are, and I'm going to open up at just a whole other topic of conversation here that'll <laughs> take us for a while. What, how does this all affect the election? Nobody's talking about the election at all. Yeah, they're going to probably try to do a mail-in election and nobody's going to believe the results because it's all going to be, you know, truckloads of paper ballots <laughs> shipped mm-hmm. to old folks' homes that come back 110% for the Democrats. It's so weird how that yeah, happens. We, Never goes to the right we, side, to the conservative right. Never does. You know, the, 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 um, the Democrat candidate for the Florida governor who was found like, you know, crack orgy in Miami mm-hmm. a couple, like two months ago. Yep. He was, he was like within 80,000 votes of winning over DeSantis. <laughs> Isn't and that crazy? they had, they, he, DeSantis was up like 300,000 votes, like, you know, with two hours to go in the election. And the next day they found like, you know, 180,000 votes in like a high school in a couple lockers or something. Jeez. And they counted. They counted those votes, yes. but they came up a little short. So what the Democrats learned was, if you're going to cheat, you got to cheat bigger. Yep. Because it worked in Orange County in California. They flipped Republican, yep. you know, Orange County, California, with the vote harvesting. So what the Democrats learned was, damn, Florida, you thought 200,000 fake votes would be enough. Next time, have 500,000. Well, and Matt, I... Uh... And I did a I litigated a Voting Rights Act case in federal court about voter registrations and mail in votes and the ease of duplicating registrations. And uh, I won't go into the details because obviously it's a long time ago. But um, let me tell you, I can I can just tell people, just believe me, it is beyond easy to commit voting fraud. And the things you're talking about, it, they're not made up. I mean, the idea of of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of ballots just sort of showing up this happens all the time i was peripher- yeah, and, and, the, yeah. and the people counting the votes in broward county are 100 percent democrats that yep. are never going to challenge it you know the the whole hanging chad thing in broward county it's actually it's very interesting it was actually figured out completely totally um both physically and statistically i don't know if you're going back that far to 2000 but sure they found a guy with, like, in the trunk of his cart, the, the punch cards, and he had a machine where the cards are stacked up. It's like a, a machine that stacks them up so that a light can shine down the middle mm-hmm. of the holes and, and read them. Mm-hmm. But if you took a wire, like a stiff wire, and you shove it down the gore hole, okay, it won't change a gore vote. All right? Uh-huh. I, I, I'm tracking. I'm tracking. But if, but, if, but if it hits a Bush vote and dislodges it, then it ruins that ballot. So the right. Gore votes aren't changed. Yeah. But the Bush votes become double voted in, invalid. Mm-hmm. So there were, there were this, you know, uh, precincts in Broward County that had always gone like 55, 45 for the Democrats that in that election went 100 percent Democrat. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. And it wasn't and it wasn't uniformly spread. It was just where they were doing this thing with the wire mm-hmm. because somebody had figured out you can spoil the bush votes and the, the, the bulging chads and the hanging chads where if you stack them up too high, you can't put the wire all the way through. It'll jam up because you know, there's just so much friction of trying to knock all those chads out. Jeez. Eventually, some of the chads are just pushed. Or like hanging by a flap. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they, they people analyzed the districts where this happened, or like you know Buchanan. I think Buchanan was running then, but but the you know he he had gotten like you know ten percent everywhere, and he still got ten percent in those districts because nobody was they weren't changing the <laughs> Buchanan ballots because they were just shoving them down down the um, the gore hole, mm-hmm. oil bush ballots. Anyway. Gosh. It's easy to do. I'm it's sorry very, to go no, off on that okay. tangent, but it's real easy to do. And with mail-in, it's easier than ever. So, what, and when you don't check ID, yeah, like one oh, of the yeah. first things that one of the first things. What's the um? Who is the uh, the Project Veritas guy? Yeah, I know one who you're talking about. Did, besides walking across O'Keefe, yeah. Besides walking across the Rio Grande, dressed up like Osama bin Laden. 
Another mm-hmm. thing he did early was he went to Washington D.C. and he voted as as um, Eric Holder. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's and he's right. He's white, by the and way. He, yes. Doesn't look at yeah. all. Yeah. Right. So this... yeah, he voted as Eric Holder. <laughs> you, just, you know, my so... name is Eric Holder. This is my address. Okay, here's your ballot. So this is this reminds me. This conversation reminds me of, um, and I'm going to bring it full circle here. We've had um, an, a guest on John Mark who has talked about um, how he's very good at predicting. Has pre- predicted that as soon as the Amer- the average American figures out that their vote means nothing, along the line, all of what we've just been talking about, there we were we're getting closer to revolution i mean because people will say why vote it doesn't exactly, matter it doesn't matter because there's so much cheating there's so much there's so much doesn't make a difference no matter how much i vote no matter how much i try to well, you know even if the country's even if, it, if a country's not free there still won't be a revolution as long as people are getting paid in a currency that will buy things and they're fed but with this pandemic and wrecking our economy with just printing trillions of dollars going trillions of dollars into mm-hmm. fantasy debt. Once yeah. the money can't buy food, once we're making Weimar dollars where, you know, you have to take a wheelbarrow full of digital dollars to buy a loaf of bread, farmers don't farm if they're not paid in currency that's worth something. Right. We're already seeing, you know, the dairy farmers pour their milk on the ground. That's what the broken supply chain is about. It's not because of bad weather or... Uh, lack of fuel, fuel's free. Mm-hmm. It's it's that that supply chain is broken down because the farmers aren't being paid. Well, if their entire currency is wrecked, farmers don't farm for wrecked currency. Right. Even going back to the French Revolution, you know they were being paid in worthless assignats or whatever however you pronounce that, mm-hmm. and they just wouldn't move the food to the city. You know they're not farmers aren't going to move food at at a loss. Right. So when the cities can't get fed because they've wrecked the economy, the currency is worthless, and the cities aren't being fed, that's when there will be a revolution. And that's where we have as to end as, the regular. As long as people are eating, as long as people have television yeah. and food. Matt, I'm sorry. we gotta, yeah. we got to end the regular show. We'll be back on the after show if you're a Patreon. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Prepping 2.0 with authors Shelby Gallagher and Glenn Tate. All of the fun and easy prepping information heard on this podcast can be found online at prepping2-0.com. You can also find out more about Glenn's books online at 299days.com and about Shelby's books online at agreatstate.com. Until next time, be smart, be safe, and be prepared. Be prepared.